Hey everybody, it's GamaDex and welcome back to another Arena Cube Draft. Let's see what we've got here. We got Jace for Mill, we got Vivian for Green Stompy. We got Turn Timber Symbiosis, a mode of land, and I love those. And they're super fun in like the Field of the Dead kind of decks. Uh, tons of multicolored lands here, Lotus Field. Uh, not the craziest pack ever. Um, nothing really jumps out to me as a first pick, uh, for Cube, at least. Obviously, pretty much everything in this pack is, is rare. There's like 10 rares here. <laughs> so for a, a regular limited draft, this would be insane. Doom Foretold is interesting. I've never seen anybody try to do a Doom Foretold deck in this cube, so I might just like try to do that. <laughs> the beginning of each player's upkeep, they sacrifice a non-land, non-token permanent. If they can't, they discard a card, lose two life, you draw a card, gain two life, create a 2-2, two -two, and sacrifice it. That's interesting. That seems like really weird and really difficult to build around, so that's kind of a thing. Could maybe try to do Collected Company, do some kind of uh, kind of Flash deck or Sacrifice deck. There's multiple decks Coco would be fun in. Uh, and then there's just like Phoenix of Ash would just be... This does look pretty brutal for like Mono Red. Uh, I mean, I'm going to take Phoenix of Ash. It's one of only two red cards in there, so we can cut red pretty well with that Phoenix. Um, and I've experienced a lot of... Uh, a lot of... Uh, victory? I don't know what I'm trying to say. Exper experienced a lot of good times with red decks, so we could take Dire Fleet Daredevil and just stick to that theme. Uh, another pack where nothing looks that great. There's like fun stuff. There's like random draw spells in blue some surveil there's the fun little clone card not a huge fan of cathars crusade just seems like a lot of mana for the kind of deck that's going to be spitting out a lot of creatures um i like heroic reinforcements a lot better that uh that pushed in for a ton of damage in my last deck it was another boros aggro deck there are some fun black red sacrifice cards, Dread Wanderer and Bastion of Remembrance both fit into that same kind of deck. So we could try to move into that. And then Phoenix of Ash can come back from the grave as well, granted a lot less often. I think I'm just gonna take the Dire Fleet Daredevil, stick to a little bit of a mono red start here. See how long that lasts. Again, if there's anything super powerful to move me into another color, I'll pick it, but this is another pack where it seems like a bunch of just okay stuff, so I'll take Fanatical Firebrand. At the very least here, everybody we're passing to, like these three people should know for sure red is not open, because I'm I'm about to pass a pack with literally no red. Uh, pick three. And now... Oh my god, Sublime Epiphany? Don't do that to me. You can't give me all these, like, great mono red cards. I mean, Ember Earth Shieldbreakers, whatever, but Grim Lavamancer and Experimental Frenzy are both going to be fantastic mono red cards. They both fill a similar role. They help you when you hit the late game and you need to push out that last little bit of damage. Grim Lavamancer can turn the cards into your graveyard into the final few points of damage you need to kill your opponent, and Experimental Frenzy, once you run out of gas, just start playing everything off the top of your library, so... Both of these are, are great at that kind of role, but Sublime Epiphany is so powerful. This card's just ridiculous if you if you can ever cast it. Um, of course, if we end up playing Mono Red, we're hoping to kill our opponent before they ever hit six mana anyway. Uh, so there are a few games where you're never going to have the mana to play Sublime Epiphany, but not super often. Card is really good. Sublime Epiphany might be the best pick here, but I think I'm going to roll between Lava Mancer and Experimental Frenzy. I think I'm going to go with the Lava Mancer. I feel like in general, there's a decent amount of like four, five mana and up just big red finishers for these mono red decks. There's multiple like Chandra Planeswalkers that are good at that role. Whereas like Lava Mancer is nice because you can cast him in the early game and just use him as a random 1-1 one, one dork along with your other attackers while simultaneously filling that late game role. Granted, not as well as Experimental Frenzy would, but it's kind of like a modal card in that sense in that it does something in the early game, even if it's not that great. So now we have Spike Field Hazard for Mono Red. In terms of the stuff in the other colors, we do have Experimental Overload. Sublime Epiphany into Experimental Overload would have been pretty great, but none of our red stuff really lends itself to like red-blue spells, except maybe Dire Fleet Daredevil. Um, so I'm not super sad about that, but definitely Experimental Overload would be the pick if we had uh, Sublime Epiphany here. 
Am I just going to be drafting Boros again? Am I just drafting Boros every time? Because Season of Hallowblade and Ranger of Eos are both great. Those were both key cards in literally the last cube draft that I did. They're both fantastic. Ranger of Eos obviously is one of those late game cards that gives you some more fuel to close out the game. Would be really nice with stuff like Firebrand that works as kind of a utility spell, not just a creature. It also works as like a spike field hazard. We could shoot it to do one damage at a creature. And then Season Hellblade, obviously, just giving itself indestructible is is really impressive in the early game. Especially on a three power creature for only two mana. Both of these are fantastic cards. I'm gonna take Season to Hallowblade. I doubt Ranger Vios wheels, but it's possible. Uh, I don't feel like people respect that card a lot. <laughs> it's probably also just not the greatest in the cube. It's just a card that I personally enjoy a lot. So maybe it wheels. There's only going to be two cards in that pack, so I highly doubt it, but we'll see. Uh, Magma Quake is not going to be for an aggressive deck. Tybalt, I mean, maybe. Make some 1-1s. One -ones. They yeah, shoot things so when they die. That seems fine. Could have taken that like Rakdos sacrifice card there. That wouldn't be the worst. So here we've got Kajali's Sunwing. It is a 2-3 flyer for 3. That sort of just works as an evasive attacker. Otherwise, we're taking a black card here. It does feel like black has been pretty open. Seen a lot of stuff there. No Priest of Oblivion. For 5 mana, you bring any creature from your grave back to the battlefield. That seems pretty good. Oh, it's actually 6 mana. That's a 4 mana kicker ability. Otherwise, a 2 mana 2-1 two Menace Lifelink. That seems pretty good. Fatal Push seems fine. Inscription of Ruin is really good, but it can cost a lot. I think, yeah, I'm going to go with one of the black cards here because black has seemed moderately open. What do we have here? Pride of Conquerors, Rootbound Crag, or like Farrakis Spawn. This card just seems so weird to me. That just seems like a lot of mana to do what it does. Otherwise, it's a four mana three, four if you're not escaping it. Doesn't seem great. I think I'm just taking Pride of Conquerors. Take the Dread Wanderer for like Rakdos Sacrifice. Actually, Heroic Reinforcements Wield, that's got to be a sign to just stick in Boros then. I mean, we've seen a decent amount of black going late, so we know we could try to do Black Red Sacrifice, but Heroic Reinforcements, pick 10. That means it, it went around the whole board. Nobody wanted to grab the Boros Gold card. Yeah. I mean, I don't usually like... Uh, like playing the exact same strategy that I just did like twice in a row, but Boros Aggro is one hell of a drug. And I'm going to take Thalia over Valor Stance for it because Valor Stance can destroy a creature, but only in the late game when you've already hopefully just killed your opponent. Um, and Thalia really slows down your opponent's removal spells and stuff, so this could really help uh, pressure your opponent incredibly quickly. Um, I don't really like either of these. This wants me to have a lot of counters on stuff. This, it's a pump spell. I don't like pump spells. I don't even like pump spells in like non-cube drafts, but in cube drafts, I feel like there's already, there's almost always better stuff to do. I don't know. I have literally, I have a single plus one, plus one counter card. So I guess I'm taking the pump spell there. Worst case scenario, it's, it's playable. It does work if you're against another aggressive deck. You can, of course, use a pump spell to make your creature defeat their creature without dying. They're not useless, just not often my cup of tea. Let's see if anybody's got a giant stack of packs. Yeah, the person right beside us kind of does. Oh my god! I would not have expected that at all. I was actually... Um, I didn't mention it at the time, but I was actually considering taking Angel of Invention way eight picks ago. I accidentally bumped the mic. My apologies. <laughs> I really need to get used to the new mic. I'm very bad at it. Ranger. Oh, my God. Oh, OK. Well, Mc oh, my God. Micaeus is still in there, too. White is so open. Oh, maybe I should just take a Micaeus. I don't know what I'm doing now. Oh, my God. I'm just in the most open colors in the universe. Whew. I can't even speak or think now. That was insane. Angel of Adventure with like three cards in the pack and then and then two cards in the pack and it's Ranger of Eos and Micaeus. We're so Boros. We're so Boros. 
Good lord. Okay, so Karn is really good in cube, and Karn can fit into almost any deck and just give you a lot of value by drawing cards. I think Karn is really good. However, the reason that I say all of this, because I'm about to do what you call a pro gamer move and pass Karn. I'm going to take Royal Eruption here, and the reason is having just a really cheap way to get rid of your opponent's blockers or alternatively finish off your opponent with that last few damage is really important in these aggressive decks. I think what, what I was realizing in our last Boros deck and the one that we just drafted, um, and it, it performed really well, spoiler alert if you haven't seen the last draft, um, was having just having these crazy curves of having like just four or five one to three mana cards in your hand and then like two lands those hands are just the most capable things in the universe and they absolutely destroy so i really want to make sure that i have the good cheap ways to damage our opponent however i am gonna take felida retreat this time because now i do have royal eruption so i already have one of those um i would like to wield this lightning strike but worst case scenario here I feel like Clifftop Retreat will wheel, if nothing else, because we saw Heroic Reinforcements pretty late, and then Angel Invention and Ranger of Eos insanely late. I don't think Felidar Retreat is all that likely to wheel, because um, pretty multicolored decks are pretty popular, four or five color stuff, and uh, Felidar Retreat works pretty great with them because you're getting a lot of landfall triggers out of them. At the same time, we had this in our last Boros deck and literally never used it, so... This might actually not be what I'm looking for also if I am trying to stick to hyper aggro. Maybe? Oh, I'm not going to call it a pro gamer move this time around, but I'm actually going to take lightning strike over that. I'm just, I'm trying to use kind of our last deck as a blueprint because of just how well that happened to work. And I'm, I'm going to very heavily uh, prioritize like one to three drop stuff. That being said, this pack has pretty much nothing for us. I guess we can run Perforos' Intervention. It is a way to get creatures out of the way. Alternatively, we could just make an X1, like, Ball Lightning that's going to come out with Trample Haste, do a lot of damage, and then die. Not the worst thing in the world. It works. It works as kind of the top end. At five mana, we're spitting out a 4-1, trying to, trying to finish them off with that, I guess. We're definitely not playing anything else here. I'm not going to play a Realm Cloak Giant in a deck as aggressive as this deck is trying to be. So right now we only have two one mana creatures for our Ranger of Eos, so I'm really looking for stuff like Dauntless Bodyguard, Isamaru Hound of Conda. Just, you know, just, just all the cards I had last time. Let's just draft the exact same deck, I guess. Wow. 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 Okay, so Luminarch Aspirant and Venerated Loxodon are both really great. Luminarch Aspirant, it's mildly slow, but by itself, it's going to make your creatures really, really massive throughout the game. Venerated Loxodon can just put a plus one, plus one counter on like all your creatures. You just tap all your creatures to play this, put a plus one, plus one counter on all of them. It does make you take a turn off from attacking, but it does buff the whole field and hoop out a 4-4, four, four, which is really good. Aerial Responder seems fine as well. 2-3 Flying Lifelink Vigilance. Not the most aggressive thing ever, but it's very good. I like all three of these. They're pretty fantastic. I actually think I'm going to roll with the Venerated Loxodon here. Um, Because if I do manage to get a ton of one-drops, which I'm super looking for for Ranger of Eos and for stuff like Pride of Conquerors and Heroic Reinforcements to do a lot of work... Um, if I do end up with a lot of one and two drops for that stuff, uh, Venerated Loxodon is going to be fantastic because that's when it's at its best. When you can cast this on like turn three, just tapping all your stuff, it's a it's a great time. I guess we're taking Seal away, but that's not really the kind of removal I'm looking for. It only exiles tapped creatures, and if we ever get to a position where our opponent is attacking us, we're probably just going to lose because <laughs> we want to be we want to be in the aggro in the hot seat all game. Maybe we could take like a crash through it, like draws a card when we play it. I don't think the trample would really matter. I don't know. I'm just going to take the seal away for now. I'm not super likely to want to run that. And these are fantastic cards. Shock, Thundering Rebuke, both 
nice cheap ways to get blockers out of the way, and then Beaumont Courier and Earth Shaker Kenra. Beaumont Courier can draw a ton of cards. If it attacks enough in the early game, you just discard your hand once you've run everything out uh, and draw a new one. And Earth Shaker Kenra is just really good. Uh, in red aggressive decks you play it with haste shut off a blocker and then if it dies you get to play it again later for six mana as a four four from your grave and shut off a blocker and it's got haste again both of these are great i kind of want to take beaumont courier just because of ranger vos here uh, we are really looking for those one drops but earthshaker kenner is fantastic and it's going to be a little sad to have to see earthshaker kenner go there because um when that pack comes back around it's going to have two cards in it it's it's literally impossible for Earthshaker Kenrod to wheel. I I will bet. Um, I don't I don't actually want to bet anything of any real value, but <laughs> Earthshaker Kenrod's just not going to wheel. Even if there's nobody else in Boros, there's definitely going to be somebody else in Gruel or Mono Red, something like that at least. So Citral Sword of Valorant is really good. It gives you a lot of value um, because every time you're attacking with whatever you equipped it on. Uh, you're spitting out a 2-2. However, it costs 3 mana to play it and then 3 mana again to equip. So I, it's another thing I think is a little bit slow for a super aggressive deck. So we have Sky Marcher Aspirant for another 1-drop to grab with Ranger of Eos, which be, would be good. But Adanto Vanguard's great. Uh, the 2 mana creatures that can give themselves indestructible are just very important, I feel, uh, to like Boros aggro. Valakut Awakening seems great here. Definitely not going to go for the Divine Visitation. It's fun. It would be good in like Selesnya tokens. And we do have a little bit of token production. But in Boros, five mana to do nothing immediately is a massive amount of mana. So I like Valakut Awakening here because we can play it as a tapped land. Or if we draw this in the late game, obviously we're not a deck that wants to have more than like five lands out. So once we start drawing lands after turn five... Just sandbag them in case we draw Valakut Awakening and then we can redraw into something else. Underworld Rage Hound seems fine here. Two mana, three one. Nice aggressive body and we can escape it from the underworld as a larger creature. I'm not going to play any of these. They're all pretty off color. I guess we're the closest to like Skyclave Shade if we moved into like red black sacrifice or something. Or even Orzhov. Oh my god, white is so open. Luminarch Aspirant and Aerial Responder are both back. I have a lot of stuff at two mana, but Luminarch Aspirant is really powerful. I feel like maybe I do still want Asp the Responder for the curve, though. I'm, I'm still going to stay with the, the Aspirants. Card is just very good. Crash Through Wield and Reverberation. The two red cards out of this pack. Well, let's see if Earthshaker Ken is still in there. Uh, I'm not holding my breath. <gasps> what? We're living the actual dream. If I don't seven win this draft, I'm going to be mad. <gasps> this is unbelievable. This is not anything that should ever happen. <laughs> Maybe that's just my opinion. Maybe I draft this cube way different than everybody else. Everybody is really loving their, their decks that draw a lot of cards uh, and get a lot of value. But here I am going face and getting rewarded. Good lord. All right, so we're taking an axe hardened in the forge out of here because integrity intervention, after what we've seen in these last two packs wheeling, integrity intervention is going to wheel, period. Banalish Marshall is going to wheel, period. Um, so we don't need to take either of those right now. We can choose between them later, and an axe is very powerful, so we'll just take him now. Um, Pillar of Flame would be okay as well. So any of these three would be good wheels. Obosh is fine too. All right, Overwhelming Splendor is approximately 5 million mana, so I don't really want to do that. Um, Shepherd of the Flock is an option, but I've got so much going on at two mana now that I might want Selfless Savior. Selfless Savior is really nice off of Ranger Vios. Anything that has like versatility like it's got decent abilities on it uh makes ranger vios even better because now whenever we cast ranger vios we could be like well do i need to be able to draw cards with something like bomat courier bomat courier at worst draws you one card if you have zero cards in hand because you can sacrifice it before it dies when they block it so yeah ranger vios we could be like oh maybe we need to draw a card off something like bomat courier maybe we need to do one damage with fanatical firebrand maybe we need a way to close out this game with grim lava mancer maybe i'm trying to protect a, a big threat that i have with selfless savior so i like selfless savior a lot here but i feel like it'll probably wheel and i also like these modal cards like shatter skull smashing and i feel like that's probably the least likely card to wheel out of that pack 
So I'm going to take the Shatter Skull Smashing. It just gives us something to do. If we get Mana Flood and we draw this off the top, we can go pretty crazy with it. So we have some high mana cost scary threats here, but I think I'm just going to slam a Sacred Foundry, honestly. Um, Fearless Fledgling's good too, but again, I've got a lot at two. I think I'm, f I'm fine on that front. Um, yeah, so we have decent ways to close out the game. Sark of the Mashless, basically like a five mana four four flyer at worst. Uh, and then Morog could uh, give all creatures plus one plus O and give us another combat step. Maybe actually Morog would be the pick here. It's a lot of mana, but it is a, a solid way to close out the game if we hit that amount of mana. I, I don't know. I'm going to take Sacred Foundry. I think uh, mana fixing, especially on lands that come to play untapped, is decently important. So I want to make sure I have that going for me. Not like a huge fan of anything in this pack. Uh, I could take like a Banishing Light. That would be my first unconditional removal spell. It's always nice to have at least one of those that can just get rid of anything super problematic. Other than that, we have God's Willing that could protect our creatures. Ancestral Blade is a 2-mana two 2-2 two -two that leaves an equipment behind, so that's fine too. We're definitely not playing Sweltering Suns or Mangara. These are for more controlling, slower decks in our colors. Sky Sovereign's okay too. I'm just going to take the Banishing Light. Oh, wow. Oh, my God. Okay, so Rampage and Ferocidon. Menace, shut off our opponent's life gain and damage them whenever they play creatures. History of Benalia. Give us two 2-2 two, two knights and then buff all our knights. Basri Ket. Put a plus one plus one counter on a creature, indestructible till end of turn. Yeah, Basri might actually be the weakest of these three, but he seems good. Uh, I'll definitely consider him. And <laughs> with, with how everything's going, he's just going to wheel. Even if there's only one card left in this pack, Bajri's gonna wheel. I guess I'm gonna take uh, I'm gonna take History of Banalia here. These decisions are so difficult because people are just leaving all these really good Boros cards. Nobody else wants to be Boros, and I'm fine with that. I think I'm taking Hazaret here. Great game ender, great way to close out games if you're very aggressive. We can also take the All Seed of Life's Bounty. It's very similar to the. Um, I forgot what it was because I didn't take it yet. The dog that sacrifices itself to give something indestructible. Very similar vibes, so it's good with Ranger Vios for that for that way. But, I mean, the dog's just going to wheel, so we'll take the dog when it does. Grim Initiate is another one drop. That's okay. God Pharaoh's Gift. If we ever hit seven mana, we just win <laughs> when we play that. Because we're the kind of deck that'll just have a bunch of creatures left over in the grave by the time we cast that. So it's like Grim Initiate or Godfaro's Gift. Godfaro's Gift, again, is pretty expensive for Boros Aggro, but if we hit it, it's huge. I guess we actually do. We do have a ton of white uh, devotion, so Heliod might actually be attacking as a 5-5. So I, I didn't even consider Heliod, and the auto picker was like, hey, look at this Heliod, and I was like, oh yeah. So Dragon Master Outcast is fun, but it's certainly at its best in like Gruel Landfall with cards that let you play multiple lands a turn. It can give us something if we if we get stuck in a long game, we're basically not going to have a way to win without that. Here's what we wield. We got Banalish Marshal and Integrity Intervention out of this. Kind of want to take Banalish Marshal now that we have Heliod and now we're going to go primarily white. Sort of splash in the red here like heavy white Boros aggro. Fearless Fledgling or Sarkin. Hornet Procession's a thing too, but another kind of slow card. I'm gonna go with the Fledgling here. Got the Ancestral Blade and a God's Willing here. We'll take the Blade. It adds to our white devotion. Now we'll take Basri or Rampage and Ferocidon. These did both wheel. That's really good. I actually think uh, Basri does add to our white devotion, but I think Rampage and Ferocidon is just more powerful. I was actually kind of hoping that like one of those two wouldn't wheel, so I didn't have to make that choice. Because it would just be a lot simpler that way, but I guess everything in the entire pack is going to always wheel. I wonder if I'm just drafting with a bunch of five-color drafters, or just a bunch of like Demir and Azorius control. I don't know. get rid of Marari's Wake, I guess, and we're gonna have to make a lot of cuts to this deck. Idol of Endurance, this is... 
I don't like that card. I, I just don't like that card. This is literally like the kind of deck that it was designed for, but I'm just not into it. So the way that this card works is when you play it, you exile all your creatures with mana three or less from your graveyard. And then you start playing them with the idol by spending additional mana. So this costs three mana to play, and then every time you want to play one of the cards you exiled with it, you have to pay two mana, tap it, and you get to play one of them. So you very slowly regain all the creatures that you had earlier. So like, yeah, theoretically, you're like redrawing all the creatures in your grave, but it's slowly over the course of a lot of time. So not my cup of tea. Let's throw our lands into the land slot. Cut two. So we have 15 natural lands and two flips. Might even want to cut one more land at this point. So that would be five, six, seven red sources and eight white sources. One that's both. And I think that's probably correct because I don't want to cut too much out of white because I think I will try to do Heliod, maybe have it as a three mana, five, five indestructible attacker. I don't think I have a ton of lifelink though, but I can use its ability to. I really don't have a lot of lifelink, so... Heliod actually isn't that great in here, outside of just the amount of white devotion that we have. Alright. I have to cut 12 cards still? Good lord. Okay, so I'm gonna cut that sword. Sword just seems slow. I'm gonna turn off my parallax card styles. Or as I like to call them, the, the wooblies. All right, they're gone. I have to cut so much stuff. Why is Magic the Gathering so difficult? Okay, how many creatures? <laughs> it looks like a lot. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22 creatures. Kind of want to cut like two of these creatures out. I like the curve in general, like the creature curve, that seems fine. I could cut like Heliod and Banalish Marshall and just get rid of the difficult white mana costs, throw in another mountain and have a pretty even split. Then I'm not worried about the devotion anymore and I'm not having a triple white turn three card. Marshall is powerful, but doesn't seem super necessary, I guess. Marshall with History of Benalia is like living the dream too, if I get those two together. Kind of want to take the Heliod out. Because it's just like a potential 5-5 Indestructible, I really don't have the lifelink to go with it. Or at least not a lot of it, I'm, I'm literally staring at a lifelink card, but... I just don't have a lot. I'm definitely taking out Arrestor Zeal. I just don't have room for a pump spell, even if I was that kind of player. Probably taking out Seal Away. Again, if my opponent is ever attacking me, <laughs> I'm already losing. Um, let's move that Valakut Awakening back over. Eight cards to cut. I don't think Tybalt is all that impressive. You're getting like two 1-1s one that kill something when they die. Just not very impressive. I'm going to cut Tybalt for sure. Might cut Pride of Conquerors? I guess we have Spikefield Hazard as a flip land as well. So that would be 8, 13, 14? 14 regular lands, 3 flips. I still want to leave it like this, because I do want I want a lot of untapped lands, because I'm trying to play 1 drops and 2 drops all the time. The come to play tap lands are not super synergistic, like Spikefield and uh, Valakut. I really like the Shatter Skull Smashing, though, because paying three life to have it enter untapped is is nothing in an aggressive deck. We're not winning by, by life total if we ever lose, because we've lost our aggressive start and our opponent is starting to stabilize. So Fearless Fledgling and Luminarch Aspirant both seem a little slow. Everything else just, like, from the bat comes out swinging with a lot of power or first strike or something like that. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one. And I do have twenty-one creatures, so I could still cut like another one here. Kind of do want to cut more. I guess we cut Perforos's intervention. Ancestral Blade seems slow too, and that's basically a creature, so I'll cut that. Five more cuts to go. Considering cutting these two, 
We don't have a lot of lands in this deck, so landfall triggers might be actually kind of hard to hit, especially towards um, once we have like four or five lands out. So I'm actually going to get rid of the, the fledgling for that reason. I'll leave aspirant in for now, but I do have to make four more cuts, so it's an option. Banishing Light, it is always good to have that safety valve, but I think our deck is aggressive enough to where we might just be trying to push over anything big that our opponent plays, just just go wide and kill them before it matters. But at the same time, Banishing Light, like worst case scenario, it's going to get rid of a blocker, like it's going to help us push damage through. But we've got like Lightning Strike and Royal Eruption for that. I really... We have a ton of creatures and a couple cards that make tokens, History of Benalia and Heroic Reinforcements. So I do like Pride of Conquerors here. I feel like it'll pretty often be able to be two mana for plus two, plus two to everybody. But it might be a little bit win more. Like if we manage to get that many creatures out that quickly, we can probably push through for damage regardless. I don't know. Cutting cards is the most difficult uh, part of building a deck for me. That's why I... Whenever I remember, I like to go through and put the timestamps in for the video so people can skip this, because I know this part is definitely going to be the slowest part of the video for a lot of you. Um, because it, it just takes me a while, and I'm not really certain uh, how I feel about everything. <sighs> I think I am going to cut Luminarch Aspirants. Am I actually cutting Elspeth too? Two things plus two plus one, or just like making two things. Uh, yeah. Cut Elspeth. It's another card for like a long grindy game because you can keep escaping her over and over. Not too difficult. Um, not too difficultly. Is that a word? Probably not. 13, 14, 16, 17, 17 lands if you count the flip things. So I could, yeah, I could again cut another land because Loxodon we can treat as like a three mana card at worst. We can often just play it for like two by tapping all this stuff. So we've got like one five drop, three four drops. Yeah, I think I can cut a planes here. Okay, I've got three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 12 red cards, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 white cards, but one of them costs triple white. I might actually want to throw Elspeth or Luminarch Aspirant back in over the, the Banalish Marshal, because again, it is a difficult mana cost. I've got 8 white sources and 9 red. 8 white sources would be 1 out of... On average, one out of every five cards is a white source. So the average time it would take for us to hit three white sources would be 15 cards into the deck, which is going to be turn seven or eight. Yeah, I think we're cutting Banalish Marshall. We just don't have time to, to dirtle on lands to wait to cast this till we hit three white sources. We can cut that, throw Aspirant back in, I guess. Could even throw in like Pride of Conquerors back in or the sword or Elspeth just to have a grindy option at our disposal. I think I'll play the Aspirant. But it's really not that slow. Yeah, by itself, it's a two mana three three by the time it attacks. Yeah, I was definitely over. Um, I was overselling how slow that card is. That's still plenty fast. Because by the time it attacks, it's as big as a seasoned Hallowblade or an Adanto Vanguard. It's going to attack as a 3 3. You play it main phase one, it gets a plus one plus one counter. Next turn, it gets another plus one plus one counter. All right. So here is another Boros aggro deck. I guess that's just, that's just the strategy. We're going to roll with it every time. Every time it's open. And it was incredibly open this time. I'm excited to get into these games. I'm not 100% sure about the deck build. We can always go back and swap it around, even though I tend to not do that. I always forget, even when I decide that I should. 
A little awkward hand, definitely want to hit one land, but if we do, we can cast everything here and it's some nice stuff. Hazard is going to be great late game. Definitely a risky keep. But if we can hit one land by turn three, this is going to be a great one, especially with an Earthshaker counter as well coming up. Even if we don't hit that third land immediately, now we have two different two drops, so we can stumble a turn and still have plays. Our opponent has started off with a forest. And a swamp there on Golgari into a mind stone. I'm a little worried. If they get enough ramp, my hand, if I don't hit a land this turn, my hand isn't really fast enough. Oh no. This is where things could fall apart. If I, if I stumble on one more land drop, I am just not going to be putting any pressure on my opponent, so they're going to be able to ramp into whatever giant stuff they have, and I'm just not going to have anything big enough to deal with it. I do have, like, my one option for killing stuff that's bigger than my deck has, uh, which is Banishing Light. So, I've got a tiny safety valve, but I really do need to hit a land next turn, or my opponent could very easily just play some, some large things that I cannot get through with my small creatures. Traxos is already a large thing, but they have to cast another historic spell for it to untap, so for now, Traxos is not that scary. That is not a historic spell, Rotting Registrar. It's going to make them discard a card on their next turn, too. I like that. I actually... Hmm... That actually makes me feel like I have a I have a good position for a long game now. I think I just pass and let them uh, let them discard a card to the Registrar. It's going to do four damage to me because I can block and give indestructible. And that makes me just a little happier about the long game now that they have to discard a card here. It is still definitely not great to not have hit a. Um, not have hit a land there. Wow, and they just had the perfect card to discard. I guess that's why that play happened. Because they get to discard Mouth to Feed. Now they can cast Feed from their graveyard to draw two cards. So they're drawing more cards than they ended up having to discard there. And that will give them more fuel for the Registrar to eat up. I guess in this case I can double block Registrar and throw a Lightning Strike at it. They're just going to have enough cards to discard anyway. I guess they're down to four cards since they played a land this turn. They're at 15. And Earthshaker Kenner is basically never going to get cast from my grave, so... I, I'm probably just going to block here. Not... Oh, they're not even going to attack. They're just trying to hold off my creatures still. Okay, well, we definitely have Shatter Skull Smashing. Question is if I want to pay the life for it. If I pay the life and then Traxos untaps, like they're swinging at me with 14 power, that's pretty scary. I could also just pay the life for it in Banishing Light. Their Registrar attack in for 5, put them to 10, and then the most they attack for is 7. Seems okay, but I think I'd rather just play like a Phoenix of Ash if I'm paying the three. I'm going to pay the three here. I, I still like that Registrar is making them discard stuff. So I'm not going to Banishing Light it immediately here, but I might consider it in the future to get the blocker out of the way. It's only going to do four damage to me any time it attacks. And if it does attack, obviously I get to get in with more, more creatures on the ground. I'll save my Banishing Light for something maybe scarier. Phyrexian Arena, you can keep that. That's going to make you lose a life every turn. And you've already got plenty of card draw. Palladium Mirror? Okay, well maybe... Maybe now it's worth Banishing Lighting the Arena. Because they're down to two cards in hand. They're going to discard one next turn. Without the arena, they're really going to run out of cards. We'll take the Traxos damage, go to 10. Because it's got Trample, so I can't, can't stop any of this, really. 
without losing a creature. So that is my fourth mana as well. So now I have got six damage in hand with Royal Eruption and Lightning Strike. If I don't get rid of Arena, what do I do? Hit them for two with Phoenix of Ash. They go to 11. I play Rampaging Ferocity on this turn. So they're at 11. They go to 10 when Phyrexian Arena hits. If I do Banishing Light, I might Banishing Light Registrar, actually, because then I can attack with everybody. If they have, like, Giant Growth, I die if they can untap Traxos, but otherwise, I think Banishing Light on Registrar is actually pretty good. Just push in damage here. Obviously, they can trade Palladium Mirror with the Vanguard here. I'm not gonna... I'm not gonna take that bet. I could, uh, if I really wanted to, I could pay the four life and be like, you don't have a historic card in hand. You're lying. Uh, we'll find out. I, it's definitely not worth the risk of them just like having any artifact and untapping Traxos and immediately killing me. Because they're, they're basically dead this turn thanks to that attack, if I can survive. Because I have the six damage I can throw at their face with Royal Eruption and Lightning Strike. So... I think I have to play it, play it safe. They're not just not pay the life and try to keep the creature. It's not worth it. Even if they don't untap Traxos here, if they just languish or play a couple blockers or something, we're, we're still fine. Okay, they basically languished. They killed all the creatures here. Do I have enough to escape my Phoenix of Ash? They do have a Ovia Pashiri, which untaps Traxos. Okay, that's really bad. Having the uh, the Wrath effect and the untap is super bad for me. They could have got in for seven instead of five here, though. But then they'd lose Ovia, so I, I get it. I see, I see the line. I see what you're doing. Alright, so Traxos is a 9-9 nine, nine Trample, so if it untaps, I die, period. They're at 8. I can hit them for 6 with Royal Eruption and Lightning Strike, then they take 1 more from Arena and go to 1, but then I just die if Traxos untaps. But I guess, as I already said, I'm dead if Traxos untaps, period. So what do I do? Hazard does nothing. Ferocidon shuts off their life gain? Yeah, literally, if I play Ranger of Eos, I'm dead to Traxos. If I play Rampaging Ferocidon, I'm dead to Traxos. If I throw burn spells at their head, I'm dead to Traxos. So, literally, all I need to do is survive this turn, and then I kill them by throwing six damage to their face, and then Arena doing one final damage. Because they're going to go to seven this turn, it'll go to my turn, I put them to one, and then they take one more. So I guess I play Rampaging Ferocidon, so they can't randomly draw life gain. So they're only light... Their only life, their only out is a historic spell to untap Traxos. If they have it, that's game. They sacrifice the man the mind stone, so they're digging for it. Please no. Six mana. Bolas' Citadel is a historic spell. That is game if they send in. Unfortunate one. Unfortunate one. Not a lot to say about that one. Literally just one turn from the win, either way. Sad. I cry every time. Yeah, we stumbled in the early turns. Um, with how long that game went on, if we didn't stumble in those early turns, I think we would have handedly had that. But not hitting the third mana till like turn five, I think, is definitely the nail in the coffin. We just didn't realize it until the very end. We did our best. Round two, one loss in. Man, I'm, I'm kind of sad. There's no way I can get a seven win run out of this deck. 
or uh, no way I can get a seven zero run out of this deck. Even though I do think it is quite good, would maybe be capable of that. Kind of an awkward hand again. No red mana for this Phoenix of Ash, but I can start bow matting around. Drop down a Luminarch Aspirant. I've got some strong creatures to play in the early game, so I don't think it's worth a mulligan. Opponent on the play. Opponent's on the play. Mulligans to six, but gets to scry two because they scry one off of the mulligan and then uh, scry another off of a Temple of Enlightenment. So opponent is on Azorius at least. White, blue, black, maybe Esper control. That would be terrifying. Let's drop Luminarch Aspirant here to get another damage in, if possible. We'll see if Beaumont Courier gets eliminated. I would hope not. Looks like not yet. Oh, four color, white, blue, black, red. Four color at minimum. Judith, when Judith dies, it's gonna do one damage to any target. So if I put a plus one, plus one counter on Luminarch Aspirant, then all my creatures are too big for it. So we'll drop Phoenix of Ash, put a counter on Aspirant, and they can trade with Aspirant or Bomat Courier if they want to, but they'll take four from the other creatures. All right, that is a trade with the Aspirant and one damage to my face. They're down to 13. Opponent has three mana up, a white or a blue, a black and a red. And now here's a green source. So we are against five color. Feeling good about our odds here, unless they can drop down a Languish or a Wrath effect. Um, it's going to be huge. Even if they can, I can just drop these cards that um, that can get indestructible. I just drop Hallowblade and Vanguard. So if it destroys everything, I'm safe. If it's a Languish, I'm still not in that bad of a spot because I can um, I can escape my Phoenix of Ash. Should have waited till post combat to do this. Um, so I'm waiting on the second one at least. So yeah, if they have any Wrath Effect that destroys all creatures, I will save my Seasoned Hallowblade and Adonto Vanguard. If they have a Wrath Effect that just minus X's, minus X's them, I can escape Phoenix of Ash. Uh, I guess Cry of the Carnarium would be the end of the world here. Cry of the Carnarium would give minus two, minus two to everything, and they'd all get exiled. Looks like just an Atris Oracle of Half-Truths. I believe that leaves them very dead on board. Well, maybe not on board. They they block there. Take one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, plus the pump from Phoenix of Ash. Yeah, they're pretty much dead on board. Okay, top piles phase down. All right, you can get two lands or you can get a lay claim. It doesn't matter. They are they're gonna die here. They take the two lands. I suppose they have one mana up with Cultivator's Caravan. If they have a fatal push survive with that to play the seagate restoration tapped uh, which means dead on board to uh to phoenix of ash could even throw an earthshaker kenner in there for good measure because phoenix of ash is plus two plus oh might as well they have one mana up so might as well play around a fatal push here now i i win even through fatal push i think yeah because push can't hit phoenix So push, the only thing push could kill would be Bomat Courier, in which case they'd take one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. They would take seven if I didn't have Earthshaker Canner if they had Fatal Push. So this plays around Fatal Push off of the one mana. And if I didn't, if I didn't have Kenra, I think that Fatal Push would be pretty much the only thing that saves them. But since I had it, there was nothing. All right, selfless savior. Hey, relevant reward. That's in our deck. It's the good boy. Give you indestructible. 
At the cost of sacrificing itself, though, that's really depressing. The boy's gotta die to protect his owner. Messed up. <gasps> Bernie Magic Master. All right, we're up against Bernie Sanders. Let's go. Uh, what's with the mana? I should check my mana base after this because that's this is getting a little sketch. But I'm pretty sure we did the math. But here's another monocolored hand. Um, I think I'm still gonna keep it. I mean, Firebrand, hold up, Lightning Strike. Maybe Valakut Awakening later. Ah, uh, this should probably be a mulligan. Yeah, after the way we lost our first game, I should have learned something from that and actually mulliganed this hand. Just not a huge fan of mulliganing. Alright, well, I could also get really lucky. And then this hand's perfect. Top deck planes is like the best top deck. This is another position. Technically, I should wait to cast Dodonto Vanguard till main phase two, because uh, who knows what they got for that one blue mana. But I guess they could have had on summon. Yeah, no, I legitimately should have waited for Vanguard. Because they could have unsummoned it. If I went to combat, they might have unsummoned the Firebrand instead. All right. Ooh, heroic reinforcements coming up. Maybe I should have played Valakut Awakening there? Oh, I probably should have. I almost definitely should have played Valakut Awakening. We're just gonna go, hmm, runner runner on the hard punts. So, the reason I should have played Valakut Awakening there is because it's better to guaranteed be able to heroic reinforcements next turn than it is to maybe be able to dump some lands if I top deck a basic this turn. Alright, well, that's really annoying. Spike Field Hazard plus Fanatical Firebrand can get rid of it, but then I just get a 2-2 out of it. And if I Banishing Light it, and then they get rid of Banishing Light with anything, that's so bad for me, because then it comes back and exiles another thing. I think I play Valakut Awakening tapped. Man, yeah, like, literally just imagine this turn if I had a Valakut Awakening as a land on the board. This would be the easiest just slam heroic reinforcements, get in for six. Ever. Because they would just not block. That was a big punt. I guess I'll banishing... That feels really bad, but I'm going to do it. If they don't have another... Removal effect here. What? Why didn't I get a thing? Oh, I have to wait for that to resolve. That was weird. That was really concerning. That was really, really weird. I don't know why I was waiting. It was like, maybe you want to firebrand something first. I got so spooked. I was like, yeah, that's whenever it leaves the battlefield, period. All right, Teferi, you're going to die. Get ready for death. Seconds are fleeting. Actually, my opponent's down to 13, so I might even want to just attack them with everything. So they can phase out one of our creatures. They phase out the 3-3. Three, three. They take 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, go to 7. And then Teferi's at 2 if they do that. And I can hold up Spike Field Hazard. Let's do it. Alternatively, I can very easily kill Teferi. Man, Teferi being instant speed is really annoying. Because if I want to make sure that Teferi dies, I have to attack Teferi with three 2-2s two and then they're faced with a 3-3. Three because three. then even if they phase out a 2-2, two two, Teferi still dies. But the problem is if I do that, they can just respond by phasing out the 3-3. Three three.
they have a wrath, I'm screwed. And Teferi helps them draw into a wrath. So maybe I shoot Teferi for that reason. They might just already have a wrath. If they don't have a wrath, like sending it their face, I'm gonna get them dead pretty quickly. They have four cards in hand here. Oh, this is this is the most rough thing I've ever done. Send it the face. That's what I'm gonna do. Probably gonna phase out the three three. Take six down to seven. Yep. Why is it a 6-6 six, six now? What just happened? What is going on with my illusion? Why is it a 6-6? Six, six? What is going on, Arita? I'll take it. I'll take it, but also... If that remains a 6-6, six, six, my opponent should get some kind of reimbursement, because that is rude. And I don't know why that's happening. That would be if it remains a 6-6 and I beat them with it. Which is my hope and dream. Well, my hope and dream is to beat them. Not not to beat them with my creature randomly becoming a 6-6 for literally no in-game reason. Ministrant of Obligation is the play. Spikefield Hazard's so good against that. And that makes me happy. Get out of the way. Don't get any tokens because you're exiled. That's a poop draw. Wish I still had my Valakut Awakening to get rid of this land now. All right. Teferi is not big enough to phase anything out here, so... Three, four, five. I put them to two life. Or I put them to four life. Oh, but then they can draw a card and Teferi survives. Yeah, I'm going to put them to two. I will try to put them to two, I should say. I that way, if I top deck into the Royal or Lightning Strike, or do I have Skewer the Critics in this deck? I'm not certain. I definitely should download a, an Arena deck tracker so I can just see that in a tab while I play. To make it simpler, it would definitely help for, uh, for constructive things like this during videos. So our opponents at two, they gotta get a Wrath right now. Even if they Wrath, we've got several top decks that could win us the game. We have a two mana, two, one haste, Earthshaker Kenra could do it. We have a four mana, five, four haste, Hazret the Fervent could do it. We have Into the Royal and, um, and the other thing for sure. Ooh, Scorch Spitter. So now, I can put them to one by shooting them with Firebrand, so I think... If I attack with everyone, they phase one of them out, block the other three, I no longer have creatures. I have a phased out creature, they have a four five. Yeah, I have a phased out three three and they have a four five, if I do that. So... I think I just play Scorch Spitter, hold up Firebrand's ability. I guess attacking with everybody forces them to phase something out. In which case, Scorch Spitter has free reign in the future. So they phase something out now, Teferi goes to one, and then goes to two during their turn. If I attack with literally just three, they have to block all of them so they could they probably just block all of them I feel like they wouldn't phase out if I just attack with these three if I just do that I think I'm gonna do that because Scorch Spitter plus Firebrand is lethal They'd like to try to chip away at these three threes. Awesome. Awesome. That is exactly what I wanted. 
because that's that's what I would hope would happen if I attacked with firebrand that would be the best case scenario for me because the worst case scenario would be they just they block a firebrand and they phase one of the other three threes out I do love a good puzzle. so I like that I like that turn of events there time to improvise Why run? No, 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 no. Get your five first strike lifelink nonsense off this board. I swear to God. Give me that lightning strike. Give me that lightning strike. Give me that lightning strike. That is a bold attack. That is a bold attack. I'll take the four. Oh! Is that game? If I play Hazret, they phase out Hazret and I attack with Scorch Spitter and win. If I play Hazret and they phase out Scorch Spitter, I attack with Hazret and kill kill Lyra because I'm indestructible. Okay, it's not exactly game, but it's good. My opponent can survive this if they play well. But there are several ways that they could flub it and die. So we'll hope for that. If they don't phase out Scorch Pitter right now, they die. That is the first way they could flub it. Okay, so they did that. Okay, well, they do survive. They have to block Hazaret or they die. So Hazaret gets to kill Lyra at least. And then I suppose if if I attacked with Firebrand, they would gain three life and then take three. So that would be my way to flub it. If I attack with Firebrand, they kill Firebrand at first strike and gain three. And that's just super bad for me. I literally just attack with Hazaret. Because that still presents lethal, so they have to block. And with indestructibility, Hazret will win at that combat. They'll still gain the three life, but I get Lyra off the board. Which is very important. Let's have a pump spell? What? Now we're both into. Oh. <laughs> Lyra! Okay. Alright. We're both indestructible, that happens. So annoying. So annoying. Ugh. Well, with Hatherat's ability, I can discard one land next turn. Which means I get to do three damage to them. Think fast. That Valor stance was, was so perfect for our opponent. It was so beautiful. We would have had him so dead next turn without that. Oh my god. I feel like I may have missed something in one of these earlier turns that would have the win by now, but I'm not sure. This is super rough. I'm just send in with Lyra, so they know that they get that life gain out without even putting her at uh, putting her at risk. Go to eight. So rude. Opponent needs to stop. Maybe I should have killed Teferi. <laughs> Teferi has drawn them a lot of cards. S sifted through some garbage for sure. Oh my god. Shatter Skull Smashing for four? Four damage to Teferi? I think I do want a Smashing, but it's a Sorcery Speed card. So I play a land. Teferi phases maybe Hazaret out this time. Probably Scorch Spitter, though. I attack with both. I get to hit them for three. I can Shatter Skull Smashing for 
four, which unfortunately is only going to kill one of their things. So I guess I get to kill Lyra with smashing. I can kill Lyra with smashing without discarding the land. If that's just the plan. But I might want to kill the Archon too. I'd actually kill the Archon if I... Oh my god. I can kill the Archon if I smashing for 4 on it and sack Firebrand. That would turn Hazard back into a 5-4, but then they can phase it out. So I don't think that's the play. I'm running out of time. I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna play the land, go to combat. That'll force a phase out here. If I don't... Oh my god, no phase out. Well, now I don't know. What is this? Just block Firebrand? They just block Firebrand, they just die. To Hazard's ability. I do have a card in hand, and they're a white blue deck, so <laughs> this will probably not end well for me. At least the worst case scenario here, I get to get rid of that Lyra and make sure they don't gain any more life. So any damage I get to chip in here is going to feel good. Do they get to untap it? Oh, Jesus H. Christ. Moving on. <laughs> if I won three with this deck, this is going to be the saddest draft of my life. I've probably said that a lot, though. Definitely had sadder drafts. I uh, that mono black mono black deck that uh, that I drafted. I thought that was really cool. Basically, did nothing. But this Boros deck, not only do I think it's really cool, I think it's pretty good. Dare I say, on par with the last Boros deck that I drafted, and it might not matter, because we just keep drawing one color of lands. That's not why, but it does keep happening. I mean, it's worked out so far. Every time I've kept one of these, we've drawn the second color. <laughs> Oh dear, we do need double red for Anax though. So we're just courier into Hallow Blade and then we chill for a bit. I'm gonna mulligan that. Oh, not like this. Don't one three like this. This is completely unkeepable. I have Scorch Spitter. I get rid of Heroic Reinforcements, then I have Scorch Spitter. If I draw any land, I Hallow Blade and Kenra. At two lands, oh my god, maybe it is keepable. Over a five card hand. Well, this feels absolutely terrible. I'm going to keep this one. Well, these last two drafts have been the yin and yang of things. You win some, you lose some. And nothing is, uh, is more evident of that than drafting incredibly comparable Boros decks. Literally two drafts in a row and getting basically polar opposite records. It happens. I'm not giving up yet. I'm going to try my best this game. But uh, it's not looking good. If I were our opponent, yeah, I was going to say I would just definitely exile one of the two drops. We did draw the land for Kenra at least, so we can get some pressure on here. Do 4 damage, put him down to 15. We draw any land, we get to play Phoenix of Ash. Not there yet. But they're down to 11, so we're putting in work. Doing what we can against this Sultai deck. Hydroid Krasis is not fun for me. 
They get a blocker and they gain a couple life. I can banishing light that if it ever comes back. Uh, they get nothing out of it. So that might be okay. I could also just Phoenix of Ash here. But then uh, I'm not attacking with Scorch Spitter if I do that, so it's the same amount of damage. If I Banishing Light Hydroid Crisis, I won't have Banishing Light for something potentially scarier later. So I kind of do want to just Phoenix send in with the two creatures I can escape later, potentially. We do trade the Phoenix and the Earthshaker Kendra, puts them down to 10, and I still have Banishing Light at my disposal for another blocker here. Glad I did that, because now I can get rid of this Golos. This is a 3-5 big booty robot. Picks up a Tri-Land. I did draw into my mana for Ranger of Eos or History of Banalia. So I could just cast one of those right now, but I think I like getting in for four a little better. Puts them down to six. And if they do have Languish or something, I'm less committed to this board. However, now they know that my Banishing Light is gone, but at the same time, they're down to six. We're getting close. Kogler the Titan Ape fights something when it comes into play, and it destroys an artifact or enchantment every time it attacks. I could not think of a worse card for me than that. Because... That destroys Banishing Light when it attacks, which brings Golos back to their field. That's so bad. Do I want my Grim Lava Mancer or my Fanatical Firebrand? I kind of want the cards in my grave for Phoenix of Ash. I need to exile three cards to do Phoenix of Ash, so I kind of want to pick up Fanatical Firebrand, because I have two cards in grave right now, which means when they attack with Kogla and destroy Banishing Light... That'll be a third card in my grave. I need four in my grave to bring back Phoenix of Ash total, because Phoenix of Ash is one of the two cards in my grave. So yeah, I definitely want Fanatical Firebrand, and then maybe like Bowmat Courier, Selfless Savior. Actually, probably Selfless Savior to use on Phoenix if they try to kill it. Play the Firebrand here. And don't don't attack into that. And if they don't attack with Kogla, that's fine too, because they do need blockers. They're six life. But if they don't attack with Kogla, then now I don't have a way to um, return Phoenix of Ash unless I sacrifice Selfless Savior for like no value. I could Firebrand my own Kenra here, just so they don't get to cast it as their own and have another blocker. And that does put two cards in my grave immediately. They're at six life, so when I bring back the Phoenix, it's going to hit them for three. So I need to hit them with Phoenix twice to win. When they play Kenra, they get shut off Firebrand as a blocker anyway. Yeah, I'm going to I'm gonna kill this Kenra. If I don't kill this Kenra, they cast Kenra, shut off Firebrand as a blocker, so it's, Firebrand can't trump block anyway. I'll end up having to trump block with Ranger Vios if I want to block either way. So go ahead, get your Golos. I guess I'm also only one mana away from, from replaying Earthshaker Kenra as a 4-4 uh, haste, which is cool. I will uh, take this Trump block, get more stuff in my grave. All right. If they have something to exile the cards in my grave, I'm going to be so sad. Yikes. Well, <laughs> as I said before, that was the that was the yang to last draft TN. Good lord. Oops, didn't want to do that. I just wanted to look at the deck. I feel like this is a very comparable deck to the one I had last game. Just stumbled a lot on um, 
stumbled in the early turns on mana and stuff, and then just got got roughed up by some some brutal decks as well. So pretty unfortunate run to that cube draft, but nonetheless, still had fun. We've got enough gold for one more before Ravnica comes back. So as always, thank you all for watching, and I will see you again very soon for some more Magic Arena content.